let's go. Wow, welcome to another weekend of Rock the City TV. We're always grateful that you've tuned in to what God is doing here. You can tune in to so many different places, so many different areas, but you decided to tune in to City of Truth Church in the greatest city in the world. Come on, somebody in here. Kansas City, Missouri, and we are glad to have you. It is a blessing uh, to be before you, to teach you the word of God. There is a word from the Lord for you. Somebody say amen. Amen. All right, before we get into it, there's a couple things that I want to reiterate that you have already heard, but I feel um, it needs some pastoral reiteration. Number one is vision day. Everybody say vision day. Vision Day is important because Vision Day is when we celebrate what God has done, what God is doing, and what God will do in the life and the mission of our church. Also, that is a time we come together as a family and we give sacrificially, all right? We don't tiptoe around it. We don't skate around it. We don't, we don't wish we Declare and we say that this is what we're going to do. And so um, as a church, we're going to come together and give sacrificially that day. I'm asking all of our members to get as close as they can to a two hundred and fifty dollar offering. Pastor, is that uh, is that set in stone? No, you talk to the Holy Spirit, whatever the Holy Spirit um, asks you to do. But as your pastor, if you would uh, try to get as close as you can to that, that would be awesome. But. Last year, we did something called One of 100, where I asked uh, one, I asked 100 people to stand with me and maybe sacrifice a $1,000 offering. If that's what you want to do and you feel like God has called you to be one of those people and stand with my wife and I and several other leaders, we've got texts coming out the wazoo. We got texts coming in from people who are going to contribute that, people uh, from all over the place, literally, literally, people from all over the United States are joining in with us to help us to do this. So if that's you, if you want to be one of those 100 City of Truth Church, if you're sitting in front of me right now and you say, you know what, I'm going to sacrifice that this year. This is what I'm going to do this year. That's a goal. You can text the word one, O-N-E, to 816-974-0013. That's text the word one, O-N-E, to 816-974-0013. Right, Q? Also... Also, in-person service update. I talked about it last week, but I'm going to touch on it real quick this week. Uh, yes, we're still online, obviously, because you're seeing us online, all right? And so we get a lot of, and I don't, I'm not trying to be rude, but it's just, you see, we get a lot of emails, we get a lot of inboxes. Are y'all in person yet? No, we are not. We, we wish we were, but we are not. We're still online, and as soon as we get word that anything else is happening, guess who will be the first people to know? Guess. You guess right, you will, all right? And so uh, continue to pray that God opens a door for us to um, do that. Also, real quick, also on Vision Day, we'll be hearing a report about 2020, all the things that we did in 2020, the ways that God made, the, the financial blessings and all that stuff. We'll, we'll give a report about that in 2020. So, and um, also, just to reiterate, we're raising these funds so that we can have a home, right? We want our own facility. Somebody say amen to that. And God is already moving. Lady J told me today he's building a door. I said that in the sermon last week, and I believe that God is building a door. Number two, we're going to use some of the funds for Vision Day for our next gen department. That is uh, City Kids. That is Verge. That is Special Hearts. And that is Swerve. All right. We believe in the next generation and we're going to bring on two leaders of the next gen department to help us do that. And our faith number this year for Vision Day is $1 million by faith. Now, for those of y'all who know me, you know that saying that is a very, very faith-filled feat because I am very practical and very safe when it comes to stuff like this, but I'm stepping out of here and I'm saying I'm believing God by faith that we can hit that number. I'm just believing God and, and whatever is whatever, whatever is whatever, but that's what's gonna happen. All right, who's ready for the word? Who's ready for the word? You real ready for the word. You ready for the word? Let's go then. All right, get your Bibles. Go to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. Father, bless your word. Bless this time today. Uh, Help us to get what we need out of it. Help us to uh, apply it to our life. Uh, Help us to be more like Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Get Mark chapter 5. Okay. Get Mark chapter 5. All right. 
Worship was amazing, but it's time for the word. Okay, so this weekend, we are moving forward with the story of Jairus. I called the man Jairus because I'm African-American and I do that sometimes. No, his name is Jairus, but it just looked like Jairus to my eyes when I read without my glasses. But his name is Jairus. And so we're still moving forward with the story of Jairus and Jesus as we are still exploring and we are still unpacking belief. If you missed last weekend, you missed a great service, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Listen to that first part of One and Done, and it'll help you understand this second part so you can see a full picture. So our sermon series this month and vision day is entitled, Don't Stop Believing. Everybody say that, Don't Stop Believing. Don't Stop Believing. All right, and so like I told you last weekend, this phrase speaks on the persistence of faith. It speaks on the persistence of faith. This phrase is set as a push and it is set as an encouragement to remain steadfast in the discipline of perseverance. To remain steadfast in the discipline of perseverance. So together, leading up to Vision Day, we are going to unpack the biblical reality of belief, all right? And so I want you to know how important a healthy and a robust understanding of belief according to scripture is. Notice I said according to scripture. I need you to understand how important that is and how how understanding that is extremely pertinent to what God wants to do in your life. The way we're going to do this is through an exegetical approach to the epistles, a.k.a. the New Testament letters. And we're also going to explore the moments and the encounters Jesus had with people who needed his help. Anybody need Jesus's help today? I sure need his help. Somebody say amen. And what we are seeing and uh. And what we will will continue uh, to see is that the help of Jesus, I said this last week, has always been hinged on a belief system centered around the words and the character of Jesus. All right. Uh, The help of Jesus has always been hinged on a belief system centered around the word of God and the character of God. Essentially, That is what biblically accurate belief is all about. It is not about wishful thinking. It is not about positive energy. It is not about willing it to happen. It is not about positive thinking. Biblically accurate belief that comes with the support of God is founded and built on the things he says and the ways he moves. Now, I want you to understand and I'm, I'm going somewhere, all right? Type, he's going somewhere. Say, somebody say in this room, he's going somewhere, all right? Now, thank you, Crystal. Now, understand, understand, I want you to understand, this has been a thing of controversy throughout the history of the church, especially dealing with faith in God as it relates to healing the body, all right? It's controversial, especially as it relates to faith in God and the ministry of healing. We see several instances um, in scripture where people are miraculously healed of sickness and miraculously healed of diseases. Now, let me parenthetically insert this. I believe in the power of God to heal. I'm going to say that again. I believe in the power of God to heal. I have seen the power of God heal. I pray for the power of God to heal. I believe God still heals heals today. I am not a cessationist. I am a continuationist, which means I believe the gifts of healing, the gifts of the spirit are now more relevant than ever before. But what do we do with the millions of people who have believed God for healing only to die of sickness. Does it mean that God is a liar? Does it mean that they didn't have enough faith? If biblical belief is founded on what God says, and biblical belief, I'm going somewhere, is founded on how God moves, then what does it mean when it comes to believing God for things he says are available that you don't receive? All right, and so we're going here, so let me say this first. Let me say this first, and this is something you really need to get. If the faith you have tries to make God your servant, then that faith is not biblical. If the faith you have 
tries to make God your servant, your butler, Jeffrey. Come on. Then that faith is not biblical. Faith is not a leash you can use to lead God in your desired direction. I'm going somewhere. Now follow me. Demanding stuff of God, demanding stuff of God, demanding stuff of God can make you feel like you have this super strong, big, bold, powerful, potent faith. But in reality, it could very well be a false faith. We mean God do this. God do that. God change this. God give me I demand. I, I, money cometh unto me now. Some of y'all grew up in, in that tradition, that word of faith tradition. God, God money co- do this. I declare. I, I, I decree right now. I, I declare and decree. And, 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 and that sounds good. And that sounds churchy. And that sounds dope. But If the faith you have tries to make God your servant, then that faith is not biblical. Not only is it not biblical faith, it also doesn't consider the sovereignty of God in suffering. If God submitted to all of our demands because we asked for them, then I need you to hear me. If God submitted to all of my demands because I asked for them, then I would have, and we would have no uh, crucified Jesus. We would have no suffering servant if God gave us everything we asked for because we asked. How do you know? Jesus, in the Garden of Gethsemane, asked the Father to take away the pain of suffering. But watch this. The plan of God for Jesus' life For the suffering of Jesus to work something more than his miracles ever could. I'm going to say that again. The plan of God for Jesus' life was for the suffering of Jesus to work something more than any of his miracles ever could. I'm going to say it again. The suffering of Jesus was used by the Father to do something the miracles of Jesus never could. And I need to say this before we get into the text. I know we think our wins will change the world. I know we think our businesses will change the world. I know we think our success will set the world on fire. I know we think that the world shall know we are his disciples by how successful we are, even even though Jesus never says it. I know we think that our organizational prowess and our organizational structure and our organizational uh, 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 economic state will, will, will change the world. But what if I told you? That nothing changes the world like a believer that continues to believe God even in loss. What if I told you that nothing changes the world and your family's perceptive perception of Jesus and your friend's perception of the kingdom like watching you suffer pain, disappointment and loss and still having you trust Jesus? Never forget this. Sometimes the greatest expressions of our faith happen after we don't receive what we believe God for. And I need you to understand this. Here we go. Faith without it is oftentimes more powerful than faith for it. Without it, faith. Is more powerful than for it faith. What do you do? And what you do with a no speaks louder than what you say you'll do if God gave you a yes. What you do with a no speaks louder than what you say you'll do if God gave you a yes. What do you mean? You say you'll praise him with a yes, but can you do it with a no? You say you'll serve him if he gave you a yes, but can you serve him in a no? You say you'll give generously if he gave you a yes. God, if you give me this stimmy, (laughs) I promise 
I'm going to be a blessing to you. You say you'll give generously if God gave you a yes, but can you give generously in a no? And for us, the lack of a desired response reveals the location of our faith. And all this is going to make sense in a minute. The lack of a desired response reveals the location of our faith. When we don't get what we want, we find where our faith was. Our faith should ultimately live in God, meaning his decision should trump our desires. That's what faith is. It's if God says, I'm not doing this for you, faith says, you know better. That's what faith is. It's not, I'm still, I'm you. I demand it. I demand it. That's not faith. That's being a bully. And you can't bully God. And so we, before we jump into the text, the second thing I need you to consider is this. And then all this is my intro. Okay, the second thing is this. If the faith you have, this is this, and this point right here, when the Holy Spirit hit me with this, this really got me. Daisy, watch. If the faith you have feels more like an obstacle than a bridge, then you don't have biblically accurate faith. If the faith you have, and I'm going to get into it in a minute, feels more like an obstacle than it is a bridge. Remember last week I said a bridge. It's leading you somewhere, right? If it feels more like an obstacle than a bridge, then you don't have a biblically accurate faith. And the question is, what do you do when the faith you have feels like it's the thing that's standing in the way of God's best and not a faith that leads you to God's best? What do you do? I mean, think about that. Consider that for a second, City of Truth. What do you do when the faith you have feels like it's the thing standing in the way of God's best for you? And it's not a faith that leads you to God's best. And one of the sad things ever, people of God, as a believer, one of the sad things ever, I promise you, is a believer adopting a faith that is fundamentally designed to keep us away from Jesus rather than bringing us to Jesus. Some of us don't even realize it, that we're, we're in, we are ascribing to a faith Jesus never taught us. And that faith is keeping us from him. And we're labeling it faith. What, okay, can I help us? What is it? What is that? Somebody like, okay, what, what is that then? Here's what it is. Here, here's the faith that's fundamentally designed to keep you away from Jesus instead of leading you to Jesus. But we ascribe to it in the church. Here it is. It's having a faith for without possessing a faith in. The church will teach you to have faith for. What do you believe in God for? 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 And we don't bother to ask, where is your belief? In what? In whom is your belief? Scripture shows us that a life, Daisy, I'm coming for you. Scripture shows us that a life-giving relationship with Jesus begins with faith in his name. This life-giving relationship is the pinnacle treasure of faith. That is the reason for faith. It is not for a car. It is not for a house. It is not for a race. The reason for faith is Jesus. This life-giving relationship is the pinnacle treasure of our faith. Faith in the name of Jesus is the treasure. Faith for the things we want to receive from Jesus pales in comparison to the faith we should have in the name of Jesus. But faith becomes a chore when we take it out of Jesus and we put it in the stuff we want Jesus to give us. It's a chore to you. I'm trying to believe. I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm trying to believe for him. I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm trying. Faith in Jesus is the treasure. And I want to be sensitive to people's circumstances. I want to be sensitive to people's circumstances. Trust me, I got my own stuff that I'm dealing with, but could it be? Could it be? Could it be that you left God because your faith was in church instead of Christ? Could it be that your faith was in healing instead of the healer? Could it be? That your faith was in love instead of the Lord. And so, 
This is how. There are so many people watching me right now who can't see God. You can't see him. You can't see him. And I'm convinced it's because his glory is being blocked by your belief system. Mm. Mm. How is it that faith is blocking you from Jesus? Because your faith is not the faith Jesus teaches you to have. A healthy faith, Hebrews 12 and 2, go there. A healthy faith begins and ends with Jesus. Hebrews 12 and 2. The writer says, looking to Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our what? Faith. We want Jesus to write our story. We want Jesus to be the initiator or the author of our faith, faith, but we don't believe he's the finisher of it. Oh my God. Wow. That's good. Oh. We want him to start it, but we don't, ha- we don't believe he can finish what he started. Right? Because that's why, this is why we need all the other stuff as additions to the glory of Christ. It is because we believe essentially that Jesus can start it, but he's not good enough to finish it. And if he does finish it, he only going to finish it in a way I don't desire. So because I'm so selfish and self-centered and I'm an American and I get everything I want and I rise and grind and I get out here and get it and I'm waking it up and I'm going to get it and I'm going to get it. Jesus, what you started is cool, but give it to me and I'll take it from here. But the scripture says... That people like that can't see God and lets us know why. Because the glory of Jesus is being blocked by their belief system. Jesus is the creator and the keeper of a faith that leads us closer to him. That is what faith is for. That's what healing is for. That's what miracles are for. That's what the pay raise is for. That's what the promotion is for. That's what it's for. That's what the marriage is for. That's what the singleness is for. That's what the children are for. That's what, that's what the business is for. That's what the organization is for. That's what the situation is for, whether good or bad. It is for and in your life to lead you closer to Jesus. Yes. Mm, mm, mm. Let's get to Jairus, J- Jairus whatever that man's name is. <sighs> Remember, we talked about, and I got to go. Remember, belief is a bridge. Everybody say belief is a bridge. Is a bridge. If you missed last week's message, you, you don't know what that means. So go watch last week's. And we'll bring it all together. I'm fronting. This is not coffee. This is water. <laughs> belief is a bridge. And Jairus, right? Is that his name? Jairus began his journey. The moment the text says, And Jesus went with him. And on the way to heal his daughter, we see Jesus was stopped by a woman with an issue of blood. He heals her. And then in verse 35, it says the people from Jairus's house have come to tell him that it's too late. His daughter has just died. Now, let's pick up in Mark chapter five, verse 36. And hopefully I can get through this because the worship set was kind of long. But y'all about to get all this. Because I don't know if I want to break this up. So this, we're just going to be long, maybe. 36. But overhearing what they said, verse 36, this is Jesus. But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear. Woke you up, didn't it? <laughs> do not fear, only believe. Underline that. Highlight that. That's going to change your whole entire life. Because I need to give this to you. Do not fear, only believe. Jesus says, do not fear, only believe. Okay, Jesus, so what does this mean? I can't tell you how many times I've read this text this week. 
How many times I've walked in the kitchen and said, baby, this, this text is just bothering me. Have I not? How many times? Each time I'm stuck on don't fear. I'm stuck. Because nowhere in the text does it say Jairus fears. He doesn't say, Jesus, I'm scared. My daughter's dead. So I'm like, okay, why would Jesus, you got to ask yourself the text, you got to ask questions. Why would Jesus say fear not? And what is the relationship between this fear and belief? It's it's, it's something there. Jesus wouldn't have said it if it wasn't. Okay, Here's, here's what I found out. This kind of fear Jesus speaks of is the kind of fear Opal, that cannot live in the same space as belief. It's different. It's different. It's not trepidation, right? Because you can believe God in trepidation, right? You can can believe God and still obey God in faith. So it's not trembling fear. It's not trepidation. This kind of fear speaks of the kind of fear that cannot exist in the same space as belief. It can't mix. It can't coexist. And so I go deeper and I'm looking and I see that the bridge of belief is literally space in time created by God and embraced by us. You can go back to the, to the instance with Peter walking on water. It's, it's space created. That's what it is. This is essentially what the bridge is. But this space has to be filled with something. When Peter says, bid me to come, that's first belief. Jesus says, come, space created. Now, what decision is Peter going to make? So the space that Jesus creates called the bridge of belief has to be filled with something. And the something this space has to be filled with also has to be singular. It has to be singular. Two things can't exist there. This two things, watch this. Here's what I mean. This kind of fear Jesus speaks of and and this faith Jesus is talking about can't exist in the same space. This is why Jesus says, don't fear, only believe. Why did he throw only in there? Because he could have just said, don't fear, believe. But he's talking about a different kind of fear. So he says, don't fear, only believe. I'm preaching better than anybody y'all saying amen. Why does he say it? Here it is. Because just like faith, this kind of fear Jesus is talking about is created by a word. His people from his house Just gave him a word. They just gave him a word. So Jesus is. And scripture calls this word that they gave him a report. In Numbers 13, 32. The scripture says some spies went into the land that God said was theirs. And all they had to do is by faith go get it. But some spies came back and the scripture says this specifically and brought back an evil report. This Hebrew word for report does not mean the report was necessarily false. That's not why it was evil. It means the report was contrary to the one the Lord gave them. God said they can overtake the land. The evil report said they couldn't. So so this fear, City of Truth, I want to help you. This fear Jarius obviously had that occupied the space between him and the healing was based on the word or the report he had just got from his house. 
and you have to choose whether or not you're going to listen to the head or the house. Y'all, y'all, y'all better slap somebody right now and ask them, are you going to listen to the head or are you going to listen to the house? Are you going to listen to the report of the whose report will you believe? We shall believe. Y'all know the old song, the report of the Lord. The house is anybody in your vicinity or your proximity who does not have eyes to see or ears to hear. Anybody who can only see what's on the surface. The head is Jesus and his report. And just like Peter on the water. What if I told you Peter didn't really walk on the water? What if I told you Peter walked on a report? And he started to sink when he believed another report. I need you to be careful. I'm preaching better than somebody saying amen. Be careful. Because if you're not filling the spaces in your life with the right report, the wrong report will. The wrong report is going to fill them spaces. Your belief should be based on the report of the Lord. Your belief should be, repl- should be placed on the report. His report says he's with you. His report says he has a plan for you. His report says there's nothing that will enter your life that he won't make meaningful. Yeah. But so many of us have no relationship with the truth enough. <laughs> so we settle on believing a lie. Watch this. That wraps itself in clothes of a fact. Some of us, and you watching me, don't have a relationship with the truth enough. So you settle on believing a lie or a report that just wraps itself in the clothes of a fact. Fact of the matter is, his daughter was dead. That was a fact. That was a fact. Baby girl died. That was a fact. That was a factual report. There were giants in the land in Numbers 13. That was a fact. They are great. That was a fact. We do look small in their eyes. That was a fact. (laughs) Once you start believing that, that just reveals you have no relationship with the truth. Because you start saying stuff like, my marriage can't recover. You say stuff like, my mind can't be clear. You, you say stuff like, like, I'll never not be depressed. Now, I understand depression is a thing. I get it. But when you start to say stuff like, I'll never not be. <sighs> Here's the thing. I'm going deeper. Can I go deeper? Jesus was speaking the kind of fear. He was speaking to rather the kind of fear that, watch this, he was speaking to the kind of fear, Opal, that believes. And some of y'all, I just, I just threw you for a loop. Some of y'all are like, well, wait a minute, you, what do you mean it believes? That's why Jesus says, fear not, only believe. Because he was speaking to the kind of fear that does believe. This kind of fear Believes. What is it? What do you mean? This kind of fear believes that Jesus won't do what he set out to do. It believes something. That's what this kind of fear does. It believes when they came and gave him a report that his daughter is dead. The issue was it could have been over in Jairus. So Jesus says, don't fear. In other words, don't believe that. Believe me. This is why Jesus said what he said, because this kind of fear that Jairus was walking in is a form of belief. It's a form of belief. It's believing God won't do what he said he was going to do. It's believing it won't happen. It's believing it's too late. It's believing it's too bad. It's believing it's too detrimental. 
It's believing they're too far gone. It's believing you're too dejected. It's believing you're too this and you're too that. It is a form of belief. Jesus had to speak to it. He said, don't fear, only believe. This kind of fear is a form of belief. It's believing God. It's believing that God won't do what he set out to do. And here's how. Fear and belief depend on a person's attitude and expectation of Jesus. The difference between the two comes down to this question. Will Jesus do what he said he was going to do or not? Will Jesus be faithful to his word or not? Plain and simple. So when Jesus says only believe, he's saying, listen, you're going to believe something. Choose to believe me only. Over choosing to believe that you shouldn't believe me. (laughs) Who's watching me now that this is your struggle? The situation looks hopeless. The situation looks dead. It looks like you can't recover, but Jesus is asking you, to remove the fear of the facts from out of the space and believe the report of the Lord. And this is what we want to do for Vision Day. We want to believe the report of the Lord. And because we believe the report of the Lord, we move in a way that says, God, you are our source. We move different, baby. That's what we do. We move different. Because we believe the report of the Lord. Like when you believe in a report of something, like you act different. You you move different. You, You talk different. You, you, you walk different. You interact different. You love different. We believe the report of the Lord. We believe the report of the Lord. You, you, God, you are my provider. God, you are my sustainer. God, you are my healer. Therefore, we will give sacrificially knowing that nothing is too hard for you. That's the mindset that I want us to have as a church. We believe different. It may not make sense to people who's adding up the facts. But it makes sense to people who are filling the space with only belief. And so I'm done. Let's see what happens next. And I'm done. Mark 5, 37 through 42. Let's see what happens next. And that was really my point, the rest of it. You can read on your own, draw your own conclusions according to the text. But that was my point I wanted to sit in. Mark 5, 37, 42. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John. Same Peter, James, and John that was on the mountain of transfiguration and saw Jesus unzip himself and show forth his glory. And Moses and Elijah appeared and they were asleep. And they was like, hey, do you want us to build three altars? No, silly. I just need you to watch and do this. And, and so we see, <clears throat> he says he allowed no one to follow him except for Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And so this is a great sign that some glory is about to be revealed. Then it says, and they came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. Now understand, the people he saw and the commotion he was watching were people hired to do this. In this, that's deep, man. In this culture, and still to this day, people will hire mourners. They'll hire actors to weep and wail because it was just... Something that they did, it was a sign that showed prowess and a sign that showed worth and wealth. All right? So Jesus saw all this commotion, all these people acting, all these phonies. He saw all these people crying and wailing and and writing this situation off. He saw all these people who had no faith. Obviously, Jairus was the only person who had enough faith to go find Jesus. The rest of them was like, no, we finna cry and collect our check. We finna cry and you finna pay us for crying. And it says, and when Jesus had entered, he said to them, this is Jesus. Now, why are you making a commotion and weeping? This child is not dead, but sleeping. That's a rap song. Why are you making a commotion and weeping? This child ain't dead. She's sleeping. That's the rap lyrics. Won't he do it? And so it's bars, right? And so it could seem insensitive that Jesus is coming into these people's house while this dead girl is laying there. And he's asking them, why are they making all this noise? Because the girls sleep, right? The But look at their response. And they laughed at him. Now, mind you, this just gives further credence to what I told you before. They were hired to be there. Because how do you go from weeping and wailing? 
to laugh. And they laughed because they didn't realize who it was that was saying it. The scripture says, but he put them all outside, put them out. And another sermon could have been put them out, which means what? Sometimes you got to put the people in your life, out of your life, if they not believe in, believe in God the same way you are in certain seasons. You don't need to hear other reports. I could have preached that, but I'm not. And those who were with them where the child was. So he put, he put them all outside and he took the child's father and mother and those who were with them. And he went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha Kumai. That's all he said. Talitha, that's all he said. She heard, she was dead. So all kind of commotion was going on around her. The only person who could reach her in death was Jesus. And it never said he raised his voice. He just walked in and said, Talitha Kumai. Which means... Little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately, somebody say immediately. immediately. Somebody say immediately. immediately. Immediately, the girl got up and began walking for she was 12 years of age. Remember, 12, 12 is important here because we see the woman with the issue of blood that they had just encountered had the issue for how long? 12 years. So she was born when that woman got sick. <laughs> And so I'm thinking in my mind, maybe Jesus took his time to heal this woman in the sight of Jairus to build Jairus' faith for what he was getting ready to do in Jairus' house. And I want to preach to somebody right now who just said to yourself, you tired of seeing other people get what you've been praying for. But what if I told you that sometimes you got to observe what he's doing elsewhere? So when he does it in your life, you have the faith to receive it. Uh, Lean on somebody and say, I'm next. I'm next. I'm next. All right, here we go. And so immediately the girl got up and began walking for she was 12 years of age. And Mark threw that in there. That was very important. That helped us. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And then the last verse says, Jesus insisted that they gave her something to eat, which lets us know the sickness was terminal. Usually if you watch, if you looked at somebody who's terminal, they're they lose their appetite, they get real skinny, they get sick, they get weak. And so Jesus was saying, hey, she hungry, feed her, all right? And so that's that story. Um, how many were blessed by the word? How many were blessed by the word? Okay. And so before Lady J um, prays, I think there's the ultimate thing I think God wants us to know is believing God to the end doesn't mean that it's over. In God, the end is never the end. Why? Because there is an eternity after an end. And the God of eternity has power over the temporary. And even if the temporary seems to be winning, the eternal never loses. So believing God is not one and done. Believing God, Dara, is an eternal art. But in eternity... We're not going to have to believe God for better. That's the, that's the best thing ever. That when you're with Jesus, you'll never have to believe him for better. You'll have best. You'll never have to believe him for better. So in eternity, we won't believe God for better. We will ultimately and in eternity sincerely believe that God is better which is what we're fighting for in the earth. That's the struggle. That's our struggle. The struggle is fighting to believe that Jesus is better than marriage. Jesus is better than money. Jesus is better than success. Jesus is better than fame or popularity. But when we as believers get to heaven, Jesus is better is the standard. We won't have to fight to believe anything else. We're going to believe that. So it's not one and done. Belief is a journey. And I want us to pray for you. Come on, baby. I want us to pray for you right now. I'm believing God for you. If you were blessed by that word, I just, I just thank God for you listening and receiving it and taking notes and running it back. But I want Lady J to pray for us. And uh, 
I'm just believing God is getting ready to um, fill that space that he has created in your heart, in your life, on that bridge of belief. He's going to fill it. He's going to fill it. And just like Peter, you're going to step out of that boat and you're going to walk on his report. In Jesus' name. So right now, um, first, this first prayer is for those of you who are watching us, who, you know, maybe someone invited you to, to watch, or maybe you have come across this and you don't know Jesus as Lord. You don't know him as master, as savior of your life. We want you to answer that call from the Lord right now. We know that the Holy Spirit is working and moving. It is his job to work on uh, your heart. And so if you feel that pull, you feel that tug, I want to lead you to Christ right now. So I'm, I'm going to ask that you repeat after me. And I just want you to say, Jesus, I confess that I have been living my life the way that I want to. I confess that according to your word, I am a sinner. All people are born sinners. But Lord, you in your grace came and lived a life I could not live. And you died a death my sin said that I deserved. And today, I put my trust, I put my faith in you. You were resurrected for me. You died for me, and you were resurrected for me. And so I thank you for giving me a new life. And I receive that new life today. In Jesus' name, I am saved. Can we give God some glory for those hearts? And then this next prayer is for, for all of us. All of us who are presented with the bridges in our lives. We just heard our pastor say that God, he gives us, he gifts us the bridges. He gives us uh, the space so that our faith our faith can be found to be as pure as gold. And so the things that we come against in this life, the things that uh, we, we come up against our suffering and all of the issues that we come against in this fallen world, really for believers are gifts offered to us to, to try our faith so that we can know that we are coming out as pure as gold. And so right now I'm gonna pray for all of us. And so Father, first we come to you. We come to you with humble hearts, God. We come to you asking for forgiveness, God. We come to you with repentant hearts, Lord, because we have found ourselves with faith for things, with faith for all the things that we want you to do, with faith for all the ways that we want you to make, with faith for all the doors that we want you to build, with faith for all of the things that this life brings. But Father, we repent and we lay that down at your feet because we want our faith to be in you and you alone. We understand that the scriptures declare that it is by faith in Jesus alone that it is Christ alone that saves us that it is you alone that makes us that it is you alone that makes us righteous and adopts us and calls us your own not any of the things that this world brings father we thank you help us to understand that healing is a gift that all of the things that provision is a gift that all of these things your miracles your signs and your wonders they all are gifts because you give Give them to us because you are a good father and in turn you want those things to point us back to you. So father we lay down and we lay aside everything that will erect in your place. Every miracle that we want God. Every relationship we've been praying for. Every child that we've been believing you for. Every promotion. Every business idea. Father we lay them at your feet and we decree and declare that we want you to get the glory in our lives, God. We want you to be Lord.
Lord, we want you to be master. We want you to be king. We want you to be savior. Father, we lay aside the idea that we have to be the finishers of our faith. Your word declared to us, God, that you are the author. You are the perfecter of our faith. That when you begin, you will finish. So, Father, how dare we? How dare we believe that these things, God, that we want to be added to us will complete us. Lord, help us to see you. Help us to see you in our suffering. Help us to see you in our pain. Help us to see you when our prayers are not answered. Help us to see you when you don't fulfill the dream, when you aren't uh, fulfilling the visions that we have for ourselves. Help us to see you. So Father, with humble hearts today, we thank you for your power to convict us, Father. We thank you for your power, God, that draws us near to you. We thank you that we will declare like David, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere, that we rather be outside gazing up on the beauty of you, God, than all else. We lay it down, Father, and we give you the glory today and forever. In your name, we declare it so. Amen. Ooh-wee. <clears throat> and so once again, we just want to thank you for watching. Listen, they've posted a link. If you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior for the first time, I don't know if you, did you lead him? Yes. You did good. If you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior for the first time, click that link. If you need prayer, click that link. If you want more information about our church, click that link. Somebody will reach out to you. Listen, we love you. It's Pastor 83 and my beautiful wife, uh, Jessica. We call her Lady J. Um, Thank you. And uh, we'll see you uh, next week. God bless you. Bless you.